To me, means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to, and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, to the Bali. My name is Ilko Bos van Rosenthal. I will be moderating the talk with our guest uh, tonight. Um, I'll keep my introduction short since we're already 10 minutes behind schedule and I'm sure there are many questions from the audience as well. Um, I was very bad in economics at school. Awful, actually. I didn't even pay attention, which is not something I would usually admit um, when I'm about to interview uh, one of the, uh, the, the author of one of the most, the best-selling books on the economy uh, of last year. Um, but after having read um, Kate Roberts' book, I found out that the books I was supposed to read were rubbish anyway. Um, so I think I, I spent my time in school well. Um, Kate Raworth is here. It's her, uh, I think, her third stop in Amsterdam in about a year. Uh, you just told me. Um, her book has been selling very well over here, and yesterday she was in The Hague to talk to members of parliament about her book, The Donut Economy, about the theory behind it, about what's wrong with traditional um, economic um, uh, theory, and also about what companies and individuals and consumers and perhaps the media and uh, politicians, multinationals, uh, what everybody can and should do in order to create uh, a future, a cleaner future and a future that is more um, transparent. Um, let me skip a few things because I wanted to talk about the donut, but there's nobody better to explain the theory um, yourself. Um, Kate Raworth has presented the donut theory um, in, uh, to audiences ranging from the UN General Assembly to the Oc uh, Occupy movement. Um, many political activists and politicians uh, on the progressive left mostly have um, looked at her book. She has been heralded as the John Maynard Keynes of the 21st um, century. Not every economist is happy with the book. We'll talk about some of the criticism she has been receiving over the past months, the past year uh, as well, but we'll get to that later. Um, Kate Raworth will first give a presentation of her theory that will take about half an hour. Then um, we will talk on stage and then there's plenty of room for uh, questions, not essays, questions. And um, I think we should just get started. Kate Raworth. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. I have to say it's a little overwhelming. This is incredibly, wonderfully packed room. If you came for the donuts, I'm sorry you're going to be disappointed. They're just conceptual. But if you came for the economics, you're in the right place. So let me just start by asking who here in the room has ever studied economics, including yourself, even if you weren't listening? Who ever studied economics in any form, school, university? Oh, wow, fantastic. Lots of people. And who never studied economics and can't believe you've come to a talk with the word economics in the title? Lots of people, too. Brilliant. Perfect. Let's make this work for everybody. So the first step to thinking like a 21st century economist is very easy. You take your piece of paper and you touch the corners and you fold it in two. There we are. And now you have my entire book in your hands. This is the summary of my book. As you can see, I'm a visual thinker and I wanted to make it accessible to everybody. Can I just tell the folks upstairs I can no longer see? Oh, there's the clock. I can see the clock. Good, I can see the clock. Right, 
Now, I know you think I'm going to talk about donuts, and I know as well as you do that donuts aren't good for us. So I decided to start somewhere else today. I'm going to be a good schoolgirl and start by talking about apples. Now, the innocent little apple. The apple has a bigger role to play in the history of economics than any of us could ever possibly imagine. Here's how the story goes. Back in 1666, they say, young Isaac Newton was sitting in his mother's garden under an apple tree. And he wondered, as he looked at the apple, why apples never fall up or sideways? Why do they always fall down? And in that moment, he had an insight, gravity. And he began to write, where we go? Oh, we've got no control. That's going to go on. Come on. I've got no control. I'm out of control. There we are. There's Isaac. And Isaac, on his insight of gravity, began to write about the laws of motion. Here's his diagram of a moving object coming to rest. And of course, thank you. This insight under his mother's apple tree then led him to come up with, oh, it's not working, the laws of motion. Do you want to help me? Is it working? You're right. The laws of motion. This is his writing down of the laws of physical motion. Isaac will never, ever be forgotten in the history of science for what he saw. And so 200 years later, when a handful of economists wanted to show the world that economics is a science as reputable as physics, they began to draw their diagrams in the style of Isaac's. Here's William Stanley Jevons drawing his diagram. You can see it's echoing the style of Isaac Newton's diagrams. In fact, Jevons, in drawing this curve, he drew here in the 1870s the first curve that every student learns today. Supply and demand, right? All of you economists in the room, you know, welcome to economics. Supply and demand, here's the market. This has had extraordinary consequences. As he tried to liken economics to physics, he and Valras in Switzerland together, they said, just as gravity pulls a moving object to rest, so market prices pull a market into equilibrium. And they modeled economic thinking on that basis. They talked about market forces, market equilibrium, the market mechanism. Can you hear the Newtonian language, forces, mechanisms, trying to show it's just like physics, it's as reputable as physics. This has had very far-reaching consequences. By starting on day one with the market, we put at the heart of thinking price. And anything that falls out the contract of price has to be given another name. So I found in all of my years of studying economics at university, if I ever wanted to talk about the degradation of the living world, climate change, ozone layer hole, biodiversity loss, chemical pollution, air pollution, I was offered two words. Ah. These are environmental externalities because they fall outside the market contract, which has been put front and center of our thinking. There are wider consequences. Isaac's insight made him realize that with these fundamental forces, he could model the world from the atom to the apple to the orbits of planets. Starting with the atom, he could then understand how everything worked. And this inspired economists to think, well, let's find the fundamental unit of economics, humanity. Let's put this character, he's called Rational Economic Man, at the heart of our models. And he had to be cut down to size to fit in the models. And his picture never actually gets drawn in the textbooks, because since I'm so passionate about pictures, I decided to draw him, and he'd have to look a bit like that. He'd be a man, standing alone. He's got money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head and nature at his feet. And he hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. And the real challenge of this character is not just how absurdly narrow he is, but it's that on being told that he is like us, we actually become more like him. Economic students, as they go from year one to year two to year three, over time they say they more value self-interest and competition over altruism and collaboration. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. 
He was created as the atom at the heart of economic theory, with the idea being that if we just have enough of these, we can aggregate how these little characters will behave and we'll understand the economy. Well, the consequences go deeper because Isaac discovered the physical laws of motion. And there's something very envious about that. So economists, I believe, whether or not they realized they were doing it, set out to find the equivalent economic laws of motion. And last century, as data, international comparable data began to come available, there was a bit of a scramble on to be who, see who could be the one to find these laws. And three such apparent laws, I think, have had huge impacts on the policies and politics that have shaped our lives. So the first one was drawn by Simon Kuznets in the 1950s. He had a little bit of data from the UK, Germany and the US on what happens to income inequality over time. And he plotted it on the page. He said, I think I see a pattern. That is, economies get richer, first income inequality increases, but, but then it decreases. And he couldn't understand it. He said, I, I wouldn't expect this. But it seemed to be a pattern. He thought perhaps it's to do with rural to urban migration. He even said, I have 5% empirical information, 95% speculation, and probably some wishful thinking. But by the time the curve was drawn on the page, it began to whisper mantra whisper a secret mantra, which is, if you care about inequality, don't try to redistribute. You might slow down growth. And growth, you see, will even things up again. Comes along Thomas Piketty in 2014. He looks at the same data. He says, you know what? Kuznets was right. This is what the data showed. But he was measuring income inequality at a very particular moment in time, before the wars and after the wars. It's war that destroys the capital of the wealthy and post-war governments invested in health, education and housing. So it was war and government intervention that bent that curve down, not the inherent workings of the market, but the mantra has taken its own life. And we now live by the map we've heard for decades, trickle down economics, austerity economics, growth will eventually even things up again. Another apparent law of motion that looked so similar, they just called it the environmental Kuznets curve. As economies get richer over time, they found in the 1990s, apparently pollution will at first increase, but then it will decrease. So if you care about the living world, don't slow down growth, don't intervene. Growth will, like a well-trained child, eventually clean up after itself. Except as any parent knows, it won't. Because this may be true for some local air and water pollutants, but when we take account of global pollutants like greenhouse gases, like a material footprint, this curve does not automatically bend down. But the mantra set in motion a set of policies which say grow now, clean up later. And then under this is the third law of motion, which is the most deeply embedded. The idea that economic progress will be a rising line ever, ever growing upwards so deeply embedded that we hear it in the narratives of our politicians and that the rich, even the richest countries in the world today, richer than any country has ever been in history, still believe that the solution to all their economic ills lies in ever increasing growth. Well, here we are in 2018. Today, 82 billionaires in the world own more than, own the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of the world's population. So, Inequality does not seem to be going away. Growth is not evening things up again. The richest countries in the world, the OECD countries, have wider gaps in inequality than they've had in the last 30 years. Here we are in 2018, on track for three, four, five degrees of climate change, pushing ourselves over the limits of this planet. Growth apparently does not clean up after itself. But here we are still addicted to unending GDP growth. I think we need to change this story. And I, I'm inspired by Buckminster Fuller, the great American inventor from last century, who said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Sometimes the best form of protest is to propose something new. So I'm inspired by Bucky. So yes, as well as apples, I bring donuts. And this donut I propose is a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. So imagine humanity's use of resources radiating out from the middle of that picture. So that in the hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short on the resources they need to meet their most essential needs of life, from food, healthcare, education, housing, water, energy, political voice. I've crowdsourced these 12 from the world's governments, from the Sustainable Development Goals. So the world's governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to these. We want to get everybody out of the hole into that green donut itself. But, and this is a very big but, 
we cannot overshoot the outer ring, the ecological ceiling, because there we put so much pressure on this extraordinary, unique, delicately balanced living planet that we begin to kick her out of balance, causing climate change, acidifying the oceans, creating a hole in the ozone layer, filling our seas with plastics, critical levels of ecosystem breakdown and biodiversity loss. And these nine around the outside, these are the nine planetary boundaries first recognized by Earth system scientists around a decade ago. They believe these are the nine critical life supporting systems that hold our home planet in the incredible benevolent and stable state she's been in for the last 11,000 years. So put those together and the challenge is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. Suddenly that ever rising line of growth no longer seems to be the shape of progress, it's balance. And I think balance is a deep metaphor from the balance of bodily health to the balance of the planetary bodily health that we must pursue this century. Let me bring this down to a slightly more local scale. Researchers at the University of Leeds took the donut concept and scaled it down for 150 countries. And I just picked two that happen to have 17 million uh, population size, the Netherlands and Zambia. And the way they've drawn it is if you fill the center of the circle in blue, then you're meeting the needs of all the people. So on a global scale, on a low global social threshold, the Netherlands is doing pretty well compared to the rest of the world. I know there's problems at home, but compared to the rest of the world, it looks good. But whew, like all other high income countries, you folks are overshooting those planetary boundaries. Nitrogen and phosphorus, that's fertilizer use. Carbon emissions, material footprint, ecological footprint, way overshooting the boundaries. How to come back within? Whereas Zambia has completely the opposite challenge. Not overshooting hardly any of those planetary boundaries, but its citizens are falling far short on their most basic needs. Both of these countries need to come into the donut, but the journey they will take is a very different one. I believe if we are going to turn our challenge around and come inside this space, we need new conversations in parliaments and in governments. I was delighted to find that um, when it's, I was found, contacted by a former student of mine who said that when the donut was uh, shown in, in China, this, this gentleman was launching China's renewable energy outlook and he showed the donut along with a quote from President Xi saying we need to, man leads to live in harmony with nature and harmony with society. It's been used by uh, urban designers in Stockholm saying, how can we develop a new suburb of the city? How can we use the donut to, re to create new urban spaces? And companies have used it, thinking how can we make sure that instead of pushing humanity out of this space, because let's be honest, that's the way business worked in the 20th century, we actually make profit and bring, bring humanity into this space through the way we run our enterprises. But I think we need to change the conversations that we have in parliaments, in boardrooms and in the media about what the economy is and is for and how it works and who we are. And to do that, I think we need to go to where the economic conversation begins in economics departments, because most people like many of you who put up your hand only study a little bit of economics. We study Econ 101 or an undergraduate degree and then go on to become a journalist, a lawyer, a politician, a business leader, a community activist. So we take that way of thinking with us. It is the most influential. I would love to go back in history. Let's just go back to that moment when Isaac was sitting under his mother's apple tree, looking at that apple. And what if just before the apple fell, if he had noticed how the apple grew, if he had sit and wondered at the incredible complex interplay of seeds and water and sunshine and bees and pollen. He could have had an equally miraculous insight, not into the laws of gravity, but into the nature of complex adaptive ecosystems and the systems of life. And if he'd had that insight instead, I think we would today not be talking about the market mechanism. We'd be, yeah, enlightenment, as Isaac saw, he thought, the market organism, he could have skipped for us hundreds of years of mechanical equilibrium based economic thinking and we could have jumped right into complex economics. So I would love to say, let's start economics again with the alternative insight that Isaac could have had. Don't start with equilibrium, 
because actually the economy is complex and ever shifting. Let's start with complexity. And if you never got that joke about why did the chicken cross the road, the real punchline is he wanted to teach you systems thinking. So these are the fundamental loops of complexity, two pairs of feedback loops. You've got a reinforcing feedback loop here with the R. Reinforcing feedback, the more you have, the more you get. So the more chickens you have, the more eggs you get. And the more eggs you have, the more chickens you get. And anything in life that spirals up or spirals down, the less you have, the less you get, is dominated by reinforcing feedback. But then you have the balancing feedback loop. The more you have, the less you get back. The more chickens you have, the more try to cross the road. And the more that try to cross the road, sadly, the fewer make it back. And our bodies are dominated by balancing feedback, which is why our temperatures stay just about the same. We continually adjust by sweating and shivering and sweating and shivering. It's an incredible balance that we maintain. The interaction of these two loops, throw in some delay, throw in some other forces, and you can explain most of the complex, fascinating systems of life, like the rise of the 1%, the collapse of ecosystems, the boom and bust of stock markets, the dynamics of your family relationships at Christmas. There's always somebody who likes to wind things up. And there's always somebody who's the peacemaker who tries to calm things down. Life is complex. And I think if we start with complexity, we will have a far richer insight into the workings of the economy as well as our societies. I would also recognize that a complex system is embedded in other systems. One of the greatest insights I learned from an earth system scientist was he said, any system you want to understand, you've always got to look at least one level up and understand how that system's working. So the economy, I draw it here embedded in society, it's social, cultural, political institutions, embedded in the living world, drawing in material matter, spewing out waste and pollution, bathed in this river of solar energy. So on day one in economics, we can ask, how big can the material and energy through flow of the economy be before it begins to actually tip our mother earth out of balance? But also look inside the economy. There's not just the market and the state that should step in when the market fails. There's the household where we all begin every day, cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising the children, do it all again tomorrow. But also there's the commons. And I have to say, I don't feel the commons anywhere else in the world more strongly than I feel it when I'm in this city. Community associations, civic groups, commons, people coming together, and co-creating things they value, whether it's a, a garden on the corner of their neighborhood block or Wikipedia or Linux on the World Wide Web. The Commons is resurgent this century because of the digital Commons. Keep an eye on it. It's got a lot to offer us. So I offer this as the first diagram of economics. And what about who we are? We're so much more interesting than rational economic man. Yes, we can be self-interested, but we are the most social of all the mammals. If other animals behaved as we do, helping each other, opening doors, caring for each other, we would video them constantly and fill YouTube with videos of these other animals helping each other. We'd be amazed. We are the most social. We're socially reciprocating, cooperating, collaborating. We punish each other when we don't collaborate back because that's the social norm. We don't have fixed preferences. We have fluid values. If I gave all of you in this room a survey to fill in about your values and preferences, but this half of the room, on the front page, it said, this is a consumer reaction study. Please fill it in. And this half of the room, it said, this is a citizen reaction study. Please fill it in. The evidence shows you'd fill it in differently. Because here I activated with one word. I activated the consumer mindset. And I activated the citizen. The very names by which we are called change how we behave. We're that responsive. I think we're not work-hating. We're actually purpose-seeking. And those are the lucky ones for whom work and purpose come together. And rather than being dominant over nature at the pinnacle of the web of life, we are embedded in that web of life and deeply dependent upon it. And the sooner we take on board this richer picture of ourselves, the greater chance we give ourselves. Because who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And if we're going to thrive as around 10 billion people on this planet, we need a richer understanding of who we are and who we can be. How are we going to get into this donut then? I think it's time to let go of those Newtonian ideas of economic laws of motion because growth does not even things up again and it does not clean up after itself. We need to put at the heart of our thinking principles of design, how we work with complex adaptive systems. We can't control them, but we can shape and intervene to shape the way they evolve. And I think there are two principles that we need to create economies that are regenerative, 
and distributive by design. Let me tell you a bit about each of those. Whoop. The regenerative economy. So down the middle of this diagram is the degenerative linear 20th century economy. We would take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And this cuts against the cycles of the living world. So we need to bend those arrows around, ensuring that resources aren't used up, they're used again and again. It's an economy that will run on sunlight. Waste from one process is food for another. An economy that's modular by design. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I have here two smartphones. Same function, very different design. This is an iPhone. It's glued shut so that nobody but Apple can get in. This is a Fairphone. It's designed to be open. So that if you want to change it or upgrade it, you can go online, see a video, tells you how to take the back off and how to replace just that part that needs to be replaced. And it says here, yours to open, yours to keep. It happens to be made with fair labor standards throughout the supply chain, and there's an awful lot of problems going on in this supply chain. Same idea, totally different technologies. This is glue, this is clip. And I think the 21st century needs clip. The second principle, distributive by design. In essence, I think the 20th century was dominated by technologies and institutions that tended to centralize capital, tended to centralize power. Think of energy, an oil rig, a coal mine, a gas pipeline, a large scale corporation. 21st century, we've got distributed renewable energy grids that can be built into the roof of people's houses, windmills that can be bought into, built into land they share. Totally different possibilities. Put these together, and here are some examples of what it can look like in practice. Start with housing. There's a rise of cooperative housing or mutually owned housing. Here's one project from in Leeds in the UK. Low carbon living, but the housing is collectively owned through a community mortgage, and everybody pays 35% of their income, whatever it is, to live there. Peer-to-peer -peer elder care. In St. Gallen in Switzerland, there's a complementary currency been designed so that if you're over 65 and you spend some hours a week assisting an older person than yourself, doing shopping, a little bit of washing up, keeping them company. You earn credits on this currency, which you then can use later when you need somebody else's support. Really interesting way of creating community amongst older people and that support network through a complementary currency. Employee-owned companies, this is a cooperative in the US, uh, when in the Rust Belt in the United States, when many large industries left because there was a, a lower wage rate somewhere else, cooperatives stepped in, often among the African-American community with a real um, long tradition, actually, in cooperatives to, to create their own community and their own economy, showing that where big business goes, cooperatives are sticky, worker-owned co-ops are sticky, they stick around because they're embedded in the community and they belong. Energy systems, we've got these distributed networks here in Germany going in as the roof tiles by design, a mini power station on the roof of every home. Transport, I know you love biking here in, in Amsterdam, so I thought I'd show you a picture of the world's longest cycle route. It's five miles in a city in China, and it goes underneath the motorway that so it keeps you dry when it's raining. And here, information, open source fab labs or maker spaces so that citizens can come and use the creative commons, 3D printers, and tap into the growing digital commons that is shared knowledge, co-create and use and share and improve ideas. To me, these designs are fascinating, not because they're extraordinary, but because probably to you, they're actually quite familiar. And this is the point. It's popping up everywhere. This distributive, regenerative economy is popping up and it's possible. So let me pull back. I believe these designs of distributive and regenerative design are key, two key principles that will help us to meet the needs of all and reduce the extremes of inequality at the same time as coming back within the means of the planet so we work with and within the cycles of the living world. So where then does that leave us on that last apparent law of motion of never ending growth? I think this is the existential economic question of our times because today we have economies that need to grow. It's built into their institutions, whether or not that makes us thrive. And what we need is a transformation because we are financially, politically and socially addicted to unending growth. The financial system pursues that maximum rate of financial return, which means every company that's quoted on the stock market has to show every quarter it has growing sales, growing market share and growing profits. 
Commercial banks create money as debt-bearing interest, which must be repaid with more. We're politically addicted because no politician wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if their economy stops growing while the rest keep growing, well, they'll be booted out by Nigeria or Malaysia or Vietnam. So this is an international collective action problem to keep your set place in geopolitical power. And we're socially addicted to growth. A fascinating story, the, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, a man called Edward Bernays, realized that his uncle's psychotherapy could be turned into very lucrative retail therapy if we could be convinced to believe that we improve ourselves, transform ourselves every time we buy something more. And I don't think any of these addictions are insurmountable, but they're all written into the social or political or financial fabric of the economies we've inherited. How do we turn that around? Because I think Go back to the apple tree. Nothing in nature grows forever. This is nature's growth curve. Things grow and it's a wonderful, healthy phase of life. But then they grow up and they mature. And it's only by maturing that they can then thrive for a very long time. So why would we imagine that our economies will be the one system that bucks nature's trend and actually succeed by growing forever within and upon a dynamic delicately balanced living planet. For me, the challenge is to create economies that enable us to thrive, that are distributive and regenerative, that meet the needs of all within the means of the planet, whether or not they grow. And it's easy to flip the words around, but my goodness, how do we turn the economic system around to make this possible? I leave you with a donut, not because you should eat them, but because I think this is a possible compass for the 21st century. And if you like these ideas and you're interested to know more, then you can watch these one minute online videos. As you can see, they're silly and funny and playful. We've got to make economics fun if you're going to listen next time round. And, <laughs> and if we all want to play and be part of the transformation of the 21st century economy. And there's an online discussion group if you want to join and talk about donuts for cities or donuts in teaching or donuts for business. So let me stop there and say I very much look forward to our conversation and the bigger conversation that we can all have. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, j just to briefly uh, 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 go back to my, um, my school days. Um, but in general, you taught at the University of, of Oxford, which is obviously a good school. Um, wh what's, is there any hope from the, in your sense from the, the, the way uh, economics is taught in the universities these days? I mean, it cannot be all rubbish. I never used that word, by I the know, way. I know, that's my okay, word. That's your word. Um, so to be clear, outdated, maybe, is better. So to be clear, I teach in the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford, which is in the School of Geography. Right. I teach on a master's program where, for the many students, that this is, makes sense and this fits with the environmental world that they're learning about. Right, but they're economists as well. Yeah. Um, there are changes happening in the world of academic economics in universities. Not enough, not fast enough, but I think they're happening because pressure is being put. I don't think it was happening, it's going to happen spontaneously. The financial crisis um, alerted students first to the fact there was something wrong. Many students in economics said, you know, in 2008, when everything was crashing around our ears, they go to the pub with their friends and they say, well, you're studying economics, you tell us what's going on. And they said, I have no clue what's going on because the models we study don't have banks or money in them, which is really weird in the first place. And so they began to create a movement saying, hang on, we want to be taught an economic mindset and, and, and worldview that actually makes sense, not just about the financial crisis, but about the climate crisis mm -hmm. and actually about the crisis in inequality. The students got together across countries. They're now 50 groups in 20 countries called Rethinking Economics as well as a very active group here in the Netherlands who are calling for reform of the syllabus. And what they want is to be taught pluralism. Just as in history or psych uh, psychology or anthropology or sociology, you'd be taught a spectrum of views. And then it's up to you critically to reflect and see which one you think is the most useful tool. Mm -hmm. But in economics, it tends to be welcome to economics, is supply and demand, and very neoclassical. So they want to be taught a spectrum. Now, there are changes happening. There's something called the core economy um, 
a syllabus that's been written. And the professors, I think, they want to say, it, it's been done, you can stop protesting. But of course, it's only being done because the students are putting pressure. And it's not yet going far enough. Doesn't it make you desperate in a sense that you mentioned the economic uh, crisis, which started in, in 2008, the fall of Lehman Brothers, and everything that happened since, the Occupy Wall Street movement in the US, but in, in, in Europe as well. Um, and there has been some regulation, but pretty much, and especially with the current American administration, things are back to where we were. There are people in the US government right now that want to go back to, uh, to Reaganomics, and many of the Wall Street banks are behaving in the same way. Um, so you're saying there are changes, but, but you don't see it across the pond, at least. So I think ideas have a very long tail of influence. And think of all of the politicians and banking regulators who are currently in power in the US. They may be 40, 50, 60 years old. They were at university many decades ago, precisely when the Kuznets curve and the environmental Kuznets curve had such sway. And the idea of markets first and governments only step in if they really must when the markets fail. So there's a very long tail of influence of outdated ideas. If I got desperate, I'd, you know, I'd go home and bounce on the trampoline with my kids. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and that's no use to anybody, right? Just to give up. Right. So what I do is I, I go where the energy is and I focus on working with people who say, yes, we want to change. Mm -hmm. I work with teachers in, and stu and teachers in high schools and in universities who say, of course, I really want to bring this into my teaching. So I make the videos. I, I try and create tools that they can use. I work with businesses who say, this is really useful. We want to think about how we can create a business that helps bring humanity into space. I work with urban designers like the one in Stockholm who say we want to build cities because actually economics means household management. And we don't only manage our households through the Federal Reserve and through mm -hmm. politica political institutions. We manage them in the way we design cities, in the way we run businesses, in the way we set up communities. So in order to not lose hope mm -hmm. and not lose heart, I focus on working there and making these ideas as useful as possible with people who are actually making the 21st century economy on the ground. Have you given up on politicians? No, no, not at all. I was in The Hague yesterday. Yeah, presenting. you were invited by the, uh, the, the, the Animals Party, Mariana yes. Tima, I think. Um, yes. What, what did you talk about with the parliamentarians? I presented many of these ideas. I didn't tell them about Isaac and his apple. Mm -hmm. But uh, I talked about old, very similar ideas. I showed them all the same diagrams. Um, and then because there's a formality in Parliament, they asked me questions, I responded, sure. they asked questions. So we, you can't have that same discussion. Right. What's important to me is that these ideas don't seem to belong to a particular political mm -hmm. party. So actually how my engagement with the Dutch politics began was uh, a, a politician, a, a member of Parliament from the Animals Party, late last year, I think, gave a copy of my book to the Minister Sigrid Karg for International Development, mm -hmm. gave it to her in Parliament. <clears throat> I was in Davos. Sigrid Karg was in Davos, she contacted me, she's from D66, she contacted me and said, let's meet. So I'm sitting there having a really good conversation with her. She was really interested in listening. And then uh, when I was here in January, it turned out that I was on a stage with Jan Peter Balkanende of the Christian Democrat. Somebody in the audience said, I think this book should be given to every politician in our country. And he said, I agree. And some months later, to my amazement on Twitter in May, they bought around 300 copies of the book. And Jan Peter Balkanende stood in the, in the entrance of Parliament and gave a copy of my book. Really? To, uh, yes. Maybe that was therapeutical for him as well. Maybe, yeah. maybe. <laughs> you know, but he I. Had a, he had a bad conscience. I, so I've heard things. But to me, this is really important that this is Party for the Animals, D66, mm -hmm. Christian Democrats. This does not belong to one end of the spectrum. Right. Different political parties might have different ideas mm -hmm. of the policies, mm -hmm. but let's all move forward and realize that this is a starting point that we should... But are politicians with. needed? I mean, uh, of course they are, but the, the, the way you talk about this in the book and also just now, um, you, you talk a lot about the, the, the grassroots and what we can do and what consumers can do and what companies can do. Yeah. And, but, but this all happens. I mean, social change often starts with grassroots, but you often need a political frame for that. Yes. Um, so what needs to be that, that political frame? And apart from all the activities you see um, uh, in Sweden and all the experiments and all the things that make you happy, wh what do you see happen in politics in the UK or elsewhere? Um, Don't ask me to talk about politics in the UK right well, now. Well, we locked the door. There's no escape. 
we won't mention Brexit. Um, but, but, but I mean, the, again, the, the, the political frame in mm. order for, for, for change to come. Um, so, do politicians just need to not be in the way or do they need to be oh, no, proactive? No. Oh, no, I think absolutely. So, you know, where does change happen? Where does it start? Is it top down, bottom up? So I'm not a political expert and I'm learning this as I'm going and trying right. to figure out what is the most strategic way of working. But my sense from all the years I worked at Oxfam and at the UN and my sense is change starts here in the conviction of an individual right. who says, I'm going to make a fair phone. I'm going to set up Tony's Chocoloni. I'm going to set mm. up Moya Coffee. You know, the individuals who just start doing something differently because they damn well want to make it happen. They don't know how they're going to turn a profit. They start something different, whether it's in business or community organizing um, or in the way they design a city. Right. So I think conviction begins with individuals, it then comes to communities, it starts to pop up everywhere, it starts to be a normal alternative practice. Right. And there's enough of a constituency that politicians can then go and stand there and be part of it. So I don't think politicians lead no, no. with a vision, they join it when they see there's enough of a constituency. But, but where have you seen that, that actually happening? Politicians joining the movement uh, and where it led to actual change in, in policy? I see it at uh, Green Party, I see it uh, so within the Labour Party in the UK, I've now been talking to them, seeing how can we bring in these ideas of bringing the environment closer to social justice. I can't point to you to a particular policy that I can say has changed since mm -hmm. I've had conversations with politicians, but right. there's all sorts of p policies that are completely consistent with this. For example, Sweden brought in on the 1st of January this year, it's climate change law we will be net carbon zero by 2045 right. and every government between now and then has to show that its policies are consistent with that rate of carbon reduction. It doesn't cost money to introduce that regulation, but it mm -hmm. sends a message throughout society that if you're in fossil fuels, you're going to get out mm -hmm. because this is going to be written out of the way we run our country. So that's one measure, a regulation, a feed in tariff on renewable energy. I mean, you know, fossil fuels have had an implicit subsidy for decades, probably centuries mm -hmm. to, to counter that. Uh, with investments in renewable energy that actually make that take off and enable it to happen at the level of the citizens. So Germany's feed-in tariff means that now Germany, more than any other country, has community-owned or citizen-owned renewable energy power, around 40%. Mm. Um, I think what I'd really like to see is, is politicians realizing that taxes shouldn't be on companies who hire people. You know, hiring people is a good thing. Why do we tax it if it's to be punished? And, and where robots or computers uh, machinery get subsidized, some sort of kind of capital deduction, it should be the other way around. Companies should be charged for using resources rather than hiring people. So shift from taxing labor to taxing resource use. And this would begin to change the logic of what companies do. They currently seek to, to maximize labor productivity. They would totally shift to maximizing resource productivity and that would help to build a circular economy. Uh, on politics, one, one more thing. The, the current political climate, the, the, the Trump administration, but also the, the autocrats, the anti-EU uh, um, movement that we see in various countries. In, in what sense is that a, a setback for the kind of change and the kind of policies uh, you are longing for? Well, it's a setback at the level that you want to see these regulations start to become normal and the obvious direction that any progressive country wants to go. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's always the flip side of something like Trump, that where <coughs> leaders fail to lead, other leaders pop up, whether it's at the level of the state or the city. And that's what we've seen in the US, right? right. Trump says, well, we're not going to do we're not going to do Paris and all sorts of city mayor say, well, actually, California. we are California. Right. We are and come with a greater conviction and greater resilience than they would probably had if they thought it was being led elsewhere. And I think also when we see the rise of Trump, I think it's one of the reasons why you get a country like New Zealand far smaller. But with that vision of politics, saying, actually, we want to do this in a completely different way. We want to create a well-being economy. We're going to measure it differently. You know, one polarization inspires another. And so it's important to put energy around the positive aspiration. Back, back to Bucky Fuller. Don't fight the existing reality. Build a new Build model. A, right. Show there's another way. Right. Um, you, you mentioned local and, 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 and state governments that can actually make the difference. And you talked briefly about Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, obviously, cities are often on, on, at, at the forefront mm. of many uh, issues from immigration to um, climate change and all, all, that, all that stuff. Books have been written about how mayors should actually rule the world and maybe form, form a parliament. 
Um, is, is that your belief as well, that basically local and state governments are perhaps even more important than, than national governments? Can, can they make the most practical, um, practical decisions to build a better future? I think the transitions we need to make towards this regenerative design, distributive design, has never been done before. And we've got technologies that never existed before, whether it's a distributed renewable energy networks, whether it's blockchain. Uh, so no one knows how to do it. And maybe that gets in the way of national governments coming up with a clear policy direction, because if you commit to one big thing and then it doesn't work, you're stuck and you're criticized and you're out. And I think actually the local much closer politics between the people and the local municipalities can experiment with community-based experiments that can, we can learn. And again, coming back, a com an economy is complex and adaptive. It's evolving. Mm -hmm. And if it's evolving, then the little experiments at the edge, the things that look a bit marginal and weird and fringe, like the peer-to-peer -peer currency for older people in Switzerland, you know, can actually be the beginnings of a realization that there's another way of doing things and what, what looks weird and odd and is only happening in one place can spread. And rather than scaling and making it bigger, it's about seeing it popping up and being repeated in many, many small communities until it's got scale. Let's get to some of the, um, the criticism uh, yeah. of your book. Um, and one of the central points, or I guess the central point uh, of the book is that the economists have hold on for too long to the holy grail of uh, economics, uh, economic growth, GDP growth, uh, etc. Um, and you've gained some criticism for that. And I want to quote uh, the leading economist Bas Jacobs here in the Netherlands, who said um, uh, for more than a century now, uh, economists have looked at the broader prosperity concept. Um, the book pretends that economists, economists never look at you know, the, the environment or uh, income redistribution, but there's nothing new in the book, basically. He says it's, it's, you know, it's all been done before, and the way she talks about economists is um, not just generalizing, but, but flat wrong. So, and actually, I was very amused when I came in January. He'd, he'd just written, a, a, you know, my best books of 2017 and he, <laughs> in, in a newspaper, and he said, oh, here are the three best books from 2017. He added on the end, and do not read donut economics for, for all these reasons. He called it the intellectually, intellectually the poorest and the most annoying book of 2017. Well, I really love to respectfully disagree with people. So I have never yet met him. No, no. I absolutely love to right. and listen and sincerely say, what, what's wrong? What, what, what are you finding so problematic here? Well, so he finds it problematic that, that you seem to say that you know, I'm, I'm the first person writing a book about how uh, uh, economists never paid attention, uh, only looked at economic growth and never looked at income redistribution, social stuff, the environment, and it's just not wrong. Okay, just so not right. I never in any speech or book <clears throat> said, I'm the first person saying this. In fact, what I love is mm -hmm. a, a quote from André Gide. He said, everything that needs to be said has already been said, but since nobody was listening, it has to be said again. Right, okay. And that's exactly what I feel my book is. Right, right. Because the ideas at the heart of my book, and I very, very explicitly say, I am drawing on decades of ecological economics and feminist economics right. and institutional and political and complexity economics that are never taught in the universities. It's right. neoclassical. Right. I've started in the, the ways of thinking that are, are off the syllabus, and I've brought them together, and I would challenge him to say, show me another book that brings them all together in one place. No, no, I'll right. say that. No, it's right. fine. I brought them together and said, look, this is an alternative viewpoint. This is an alternative starting point. And as for growth, every time I, 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 I um, go to, I think it was actually when I was here in January and I was, they, the economists were saying to me, you know, this whole thing about growth and we don't do this. It was very funny because that week, I think the, the king of the Netherlands had said something like, well, our economy is healthy again because it's growing again. It's like, you see, this, this narrative is deeply, deeply embedded. Well, he's here. We invited the... <laughs> As a Come mystery on. guest. <laughs> but but <coughs> some economists have, and, I, and one, I think the place where the misunderstanding or disagreement sits is economists often say to me, we do research on these things. Look at this interesting, sophisticated right. piece of research I'm doing. And I say, I'm not criticizing every piece of research that economists do. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about what economists teach. Right. So I challenge you, Bas Jacobs, 
Show me the first diagram you teach. I'm going to bet it's supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Show me the biggest picture you have of the economy. I'm going to bet it does not sit inside the living world. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you talk about the living world. I'm going to bet you call it an externality. And in the 21st century, if we go around talking about the planet on which our lives depend as an externality, I do not see that this is going to serve us well to protect mm -hmm. our planetary home. I guess what he would say, and then, then, then we'll, we'll stop there. Um, no, you can keep on going. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not him. But, um, no, if, if you look at the, the Nobel Prizes uh, of late, Angus Deaton a couple of years ago who wrote a book on, on poverty and economics, uh, Jean Tirole, Economics for the Common Good, uh, published uh, uh, I think a couple of years ago. Um, most of the Nobel Prizes for economics go to books that specifically look at fairness, redistribution and that kind of stuff. And you would go back to teaching. That's not what they teach. Sure. Uh, so, and most of them, I think, is a bit of an exaggeration. You've picked out the really nice ones that go to those things. Right. Many of them go to people but who these, come these up. But these are two of the books of the past, two of the Nobel yes. Prizes of the past four years. I mean, so I was in Davos in January, and there was a dinner with the Nobel Prizes of Economics. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there were four of the most recent Nobel Prize, Angus Deaton, um, and Joseph Stiglitz. Stiglitz. Um, it wasn't Jean Tirol, it was a couple of others. Mm -hmm. And they each gave about 10 minutes talk on the state of the world economy. We sat and had dinner and listened to them. And I listened and all of them spoke. They said language like, well, of course, the economy's health is picking up again. Mm -hmm. It's this line. Mm -hmm. Growth is bad. Mm -hmm. Not one of them mentioned climate change in their comments. And I happened to be there, and the, the, the female economist who was moderating the evening, I think she felt it was kind of a little male heavy in the conversation. She just said to me, do you want to say something? So it's one of those moments you think, oh God, I have to say yes. Okay, I'll say something. So I stood up and I just said, look, I res respectfully listening to you, I very much noticed that everybody spoke as if the economy's health can be measured by GDP and nobody mentioned climate change. And they did look a bit shamefaced, I have to say. But I talked to them afterwards, and what I was struck at in Davos, I went to sessions where there were uh, senators from the US who were saying, like, um, uh, uh, one, of the senator, one of the senators from California or from Washington State saying, I want my state to be the first state to introduce a carbon tax. This level of ambition, mm -hmm. I want to make transformation. I heard corporate leaders saying, we're going to create a zero net, net zero carbon supply chain in our business. Whether they follow up on it is another thing, but the ambition is there. I spoke to two of these prize-winning economists afterwards, and I said, I really think the syllabus of economics needs to be re-transformed. Re and they both went like this. That will take a very long time. And I just thought, where's the ambition? Where's the ambition? Today's students are the policymakers of the 21st century. How? Can we think it's decent to keep teaching them ideas drawn up hundreds of years ago? Because if Adam Smith was alive, or John Maynard Keynes was alive, or Simon Kuznets was alive, and we showed them the state of the world, I swear they'd be the first to roll up their sleeves. So somebody who's graduating from high school now and wants to go to um, learn economics in, in September, um, what would you advise him or her uh, to do? I would say, first of all, go to the Rethinking Economics website. Mm -hmm. Acquaint yourselves with your fellow students who are trying to transform this discipline. Because mm -hmm. it's a great irony that students turn up at university, dedicate years of their life and probably a lot of money right. to studying a subject that they then realize, I need to help rewrite the syllabus of the very subject I've turned up to study. Right, but so, they really want to go to the university. Okay, fine. To, to join, the building and to classes. Join Rethinking and go on the Rethinking site and ask other students, where are you getting a critical pluralist education? Where in the Netherlands? Where, wherever I am in Europe? Listen to your fellow students, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And where in, in the UK, are there some good examples, some, some schools, some universities that do teach uh, economics in, 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 a, in a better way? There are ones that are in a better way. So I was at, uh, and now I have to say a Dutch word. That's fine. Gabaud University. Gabaud University. Gabaud University this Nijmegen. afternoon. They were very, Nijmegen, yeah. They were very pleased to Nijmegen, say. Nijmegen, can you say? No. Nijmegen. Nijmegen. They were very pleased to say that our, our, the students rated the syllabuses in all four universities uh, uh, to see how much of it was neoclassical and how much of it was other mm -hmm. disciplines. And 75% of what's taught in the syllabus in the Netherlands is neoclassical. And then there's a little bit of other stuff on the, underneath. And Nijmegen came up best. So... 
they were best, but it doesn't mean they're good enough. It means right. they were doing better than the others. Right. Um, there are very few new universities that I say are, are offering this fully pluralist mm -hmm. perspective yet. What about the, the multinationals? We haven't talked about that yet. Um, um, are, are, are they the slowest learners, you would say? Multinational companies? Yes, sorry. Um, I would, I would have to absolutely pick them off individually mm -hmm. because I think there's just an enormous spectrum there. What, what are the best practices? Which, I mean, the big oil companies, Royal Dutch Shell, that kind of... No. <laughs> best practice is to say, bye-bye fossil fuels, I am going to become an energy company, and you were my past and you are not my future. That, to me, would right. be a best practice no, energy no, but company. But do you see that happening? I'm just, that's why I'm, I'm just trying to get examples, okay. whether it's companies or politicians or universities that people can actually look at and learn from. Okay, so, but you said to me the big corporations and that's, made, that's why I'm feeling No, no, stuck. I understand. Because, let's, okay, let's, let, I think corporations, what they do and can be in the world is really determined by the way they're designed internally. Mm -hmm. Five principles, what is your purpose, right? If you want to understand any company, ask, what is your purpose? Uh, do you have a, a narrow financial purpose or do you actually have a purpose far bigger than yourself? How are you governed? What are the metrics by which you judge your own success and you hold your own staff to account? How are you network with your suppliers, your customers, your competitors and, and alliances? Going deeper now, how are you owned? Are you owned by your employees, by a family, by private investors, or are you owned by the stock market? Because how you're owned determines the finance that underpins you. And whether it values social environmental return as well as a financial return, or whether it just wants the highest, shortest term financial return. And I'll give you company Unilever. Paul Pullman, I see him really trying to transform the purpose of Unilever. It has a sustainable living plan. Unilever, yeah. Yeah, Unilever, shall I say like No, no, that? it was fine, just in case <laughs> uh, okay. I missed it. Um, governance, they've got 69 metrics on cutting carbon out of the chain, water use, all sorts of progressive social environmental metrics, networking with progressive companies, working with NGOs. So all moving to a sort of generative future where it's transformative, but <clears throat> still owned by the stock market mm -hmm. and therefore still owned by finance that says, I want the highest, fastest rate of return, which is why around this time last year, in February last year, Unilever was almost taken over in a hostile takeover bit mm -hmm. by Kraft and 3G. Mm -hmm. Unilever is trying to become a generative 21st century company. The stock market pulls it back in an extractive mindset. So most corporations that are owned by the, financial, by the, by the shareholders, I think are caught because they're pulled back by last century's finance. So actually, when I want to find a really progressive company, or if I do find a really progressive company, I ask them, how are you owned? And you know what? It's never a coincidence. They're not owned by the stock market. They're owned by a family firm or private investors or people who put in social capital or patient capital to underpin those values. I'll give you one example. Houdini, mm -hmm. a Swedish sportswear company that makes ski clothes and all sorts of sports clothes. Their purpose is to maximize people's ability to enjoy the living world and minimize their impact upon it. They create all their clothing from circular economy, from, from organic fibers that can be decomposed or from recycled nylon, recycled polyester. And uh, they've actually recently published last month the first uh, assessment by a company of their impact on planetary boundaries on the outside of the donut. They looked at all the different fibers they use on labor rights, on animal welfare, and try to see their impact in terms of the donut itself. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's an example of a company that's absolutely driven by purpose. Now, Houdini's clothing is expensive. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. In the same way as it's expensive to put a solar panel on the roof of your house in 1975. <laughs> because what they're doing is extraordinary. And that's why we come back. We need government regulation. We need shifts and norms in standards of industry so that every textile company is making all of our clothing in a recent recycled, reused way, and then the cost curve will come down in the future. What we didn't discuss is the, the developing countries. And um, in, in what sense is, I mean, the economy you want uh, is something that, that we here in, in, in the UK or in the Netherlands can, can talk about. India is quite a different story. Uh, they still are in the process of lifting millions of people from, from poverty and maybe you know, a, a greener economy is not top of mind um, for the policymakers in India. I think that's true because I think the environmental Kuznets curve has a very long tail and the story lives on. Grow now, clean up later. Except India has the most polluted air and the soil in the world. 
Uh, it's hit by climate change, and there are states in India where there's just not enough water to continue agriculture. So but they, they first want to. This is all true, but they first want to feed their people. Yeah, but you can't feed your people if there's no rain. No, no. But do people have? Uh, but people have the, the the. You know, if you're if if you don't have enough food, you often have a have a short term. You know, you don't look at the long term. And this is the thing. And I think actually countries like India and China, I bet, I think they get it quicker than countries like yours and mine, because we come from colonial countries. Right. That if we didn't have enough, well, I'll just take over a few other lands overseas and we'll just import and we'll exploit. They yeah, can't you've do done that. The, your country has done that more than... Oh, do you want to... <laughs> <laughs> so now... now at least we, if you look at total space. Right, and we, our countries did this at a time when the, it was what Herman Daly, the ecological economist, would talk, he called it empty world, mm -hmm. where the human impact was quite small relative to the world, and this sense of, well, there's always more land, there's always more sky. We never imagined that we could have an impact on the way the world works, and that's why this ever-rising line of growth expansion just seemed to work. India, China... And many other countries find themselves trying to go through that same phase in full world. Mm -hmm. Full, where the, the climate system is already threatening to break down, where the monsoons may never fall, where the soil is already polluted, where the air, people can't breathe. So they actually, I think, they feel both sides of the donut, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's no surprise to me that China is the country that's come out and says what we want to create for a long vision, for a long future. It's easier when you've got a dictatorship, of course. An ecological civilization. That's the language they use. We are creating here in China an ecological civilization. I would love to hear somebody in the European Union or in any European Parliament stand up and say, our policy is an ecological civilization. Because actually that's what we need to get to. So I think they, they get it fast. You can't grow now and clean up later because we destroy the environment. We destroy the climate stability in the process and the rains never come. So the peak of climbing up that hill is too high for humanity to survive. And that's why I think they have to follow and they know they have to follow a different route than our own countries followed. Final question and then we'll go, go to audience questions. You, you mentioned you were in Davos. Are you there every year or no, I just, how often? That was the first time the I first ever time. went. Okay. And I was wondering because you mentioned Paul Polman and, 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 and Unilever. I, I was in Davos last year and he had some audience but not the biggest. I'm just trying to find out if in Davos, which is you know the World Cup of, of neoliberalism, if you've seen a... Um, in a, in a, seen a positive development over the years, but I guess it's hard I've to say if you've there only once. been there once. Well, I, when I was there, people were saying there is more, there are more sessions on climate change and on the environment than ever before. But I'm very aware that Davos is a place, it's a place of total self-selection of the right. menu. You right. go to the sessions you want to go to. So while I was presenting and there was a giant screen behind me with the head of WWF and we were presenting the data of the living world, mm. it was very dramatic, but you know, most people who needed to hear it were often negotiating some trade deal in another right, room. Right. So that's the risk of Davos. I, it's theatre. It's theatre and it's, you know, come if you want. Okay. Fair enough. Are there questions from the audience? Right over here. Um, does it work? Yeah. This weekend um, I saw on TV um, Arnold Boat, who's professor of the financials, no, the Sustainable Finance Lab. And he said that the flows of cash around the world are so significant that local economies and local politics just lose any meaning. So in that light, how could you perceive donut economics to ever work? This was a professor in, working in a sustainable finance lab. Well, then I would say, what are you doing in your job? I mean, he's working in the, in the kind of finance that we need. And it sounds like he's saying, what I'm doing is just too, too small. I, I'm not going to give up, you know, because, if, it, because I don't know whether we can do this or not. But if we decide we can't do it, then we definitely can't do it. It's self-fulfilling. So I keep working with the people who say, yep, we're starting to make this happen. We're starting to make it work here. I don't know how or if it builds up, and it's definitely teamwork. I'm bringing one tiny piece of a very, very big jigsaw puzzle saying, I think we should redraw the diagrams that are taught at the start of economics because it changes our mindset. But we need a different way of doing politics. We definitely need to transform the finance system. I don't know if it comes out well at the other end of the story. We've never been there. But I'm just passionately committing my life's work to being part of making that possible. Because if we don't, it definitely won't be possible. So I really hope that that was him having a particularly dark moment. 
Thank you. Over here. Then we'll go back. Uh, what, would you, what would you think of the sustainable development goals? Because they still advocate 7% growth and they call themselves sustainable. And secondly, do you think that non-Western well-being theories have anything to offer for the way forward? Great questions. Okay, so the sustainable development goals, it's absolutely true. When you read the sustainable development goals, there's something like a Trojan horse, because right in the middle, goal eight, has decent work and economic growth. And the symbol of this one, most of them are nice symbols of happy families, and the symbol is this line going ever up. It is the line of growth. So why is it in there? As I said, I crowdsourced the heart of the donut from the SDGs, you might have noticed I left that one behind because I picked out the social priorities and I wanted to ask an open question, what kind of economic system is compatible with bringing us here? In the SDGs, the answer has been written in, it's growth. Now let me take the political answer to that question. Why might it be there? Because when you invite the world's countries to agree to protect a stable climate, to protect the oceans, I have no surprise that low-income countries think, mm-hmm, and if we agree that there's a cap on global carbon emissions, who is going to then be told that they can't develop? So I think there is, I'm, I'm thinking from, I'm, I'm leaning into understanding it politically. It's written in there to, as a promise to the lower-income countries, yes, you can still have economic growth, which I think they absolutely should have. They need to, a, a growing economy so that they can have health and education and food and housing for all. The trouble is that then it becomes interpreted growth for all. Inclu there's no distinction written in there. Your second question, what do I think that, that how did you phrase it again? That Non-Western well-being theories. So Non-Western well-being theories. Okay. When I, I don't have the slide here, but when, oh, no, that's okay. When I first drew this diagram back in 2012, I was really amazed by the traction it had. It, so, people suddenly started coming up to me saying, are you the donut lady? And I thought, what have I done to my career? <laughs> There's no going back from this. But I was fascinated because if you took all the words in that picture and just wrote them in a list, nobody would blink. We've heard those words before. So what is it about the picture that changes that? And then I started thinking about the power of pictures and I looked at Images of well-being from, as you say, non-Western cultures. So everybody think of the Taoist yin-yang, right? It's got a sort of inherent dynamism. If you know the Maori takarangi, I'll try and do it with my fingers. It's a bit like this. So it's two spinning spirals. Uh, the Buddhist endless knot, Celtic double spiral. And I was fascinated when I looked at these pictures. I thought, my goodness, they look a bit like the donut. There's a sort of dynamic balance written into them. And maybe there's a deep cultural wisdom in those diagrams that perhaps it's time to return to. We've been through this phase of ever rising growth. It was deeply fueled by fossil fuels, by the way, and expansion overseas. And oh, there's always more, there's always more. And suddenly there's not always more. And we need to learn to flatten that curve and perhaps turning back to these shapes of dynamic balance profoundly go into our visual cortex at the back of the head and start to help us think that progress is not ever ending growth. It's health and balance. So yeah, I think there's a lot of deep wisdom in them. Great. There's a gentleman over there and then we'll um, climb the stairs. Yeah, back row. Uh, hi, thank you uh, for speaking to us today. I was wondering about a question that was raised kind of in the interview uh, about in some, in some sense, um, we have the instable political climate, but as long as we embrace those ideas that work and that, that fit within the donut, um, eventually enough politicians will join and we create some kind of uh, enough, enough um, support for these ideas. But I was wondering, um, to what extent is the donut a threat to, to kind of many people and what, to what extent does it make people angrier? They, uh, and to what extent does it actually fuel the instability and unhappiness that people have with our current political system as they don't feel like they're being recognized? Uh, have you thought about this in any way? Um, what are your ideas? I know it made Bas Jacobs angry, but <laughs> can you just say a bit more about why? Because well, I, I, I really want to understand who, who would feel threatened by it or angry? Um, so I think that, for example, by pushing these initiatives like um, getting people from, from uh, gas-fueled uh, cooking to, to electricity-fueled cooking. Um, these kind of initiatives, they cost a lot of money, and, and uh, pushing these policies onto people that cannot afford it, maybe do not want it, um, can maybe actually 
distance this gap? Because you said you have people who will embrace it and people who will embrace the current. And as long as enough people join this, this is one polarization follows its other. But to me, it seemed like that's just polarization. And to what extent can we get those people actually into uh, our vision? I will say our because I think that's pretty accurate here um, of the world. And uh, to what extent are we actually a threat, a force that maybe makes people less comfortable in the current political system? Okay, so I haven't deeply thought about that question. It's really interesting. But one thing, uh, I agree polarization isn't helpful. That's partly why I say I'm really pleased that both Party for the Animals, D66, and Christian, Democrat, Christ, yeah, Christian Democrats have in different ways engaged with the book because it's important to rise above political spectrum differences and say we all need to be moving to this way. You, you gave an example of somebody says, well, I can't afford to shift from gas-based uh, cooking to electricity-based cooking. Transition is hard and transition have, has, can have costs. I want to say two things there. One, governments need to drive investment in renewable energies because the wonderful thing about renewable energy is that electric cost curve is coming crashing down faster than anybody in the world ever thought. The International Energy Agency keeps having to revise its forecasts because the price is just coming down so much faster and the take up is happening so much faster. You know, we, on wind adoption, decades ahead of where people said it would be. So the costs are coming in our favor. But also I would say, probably not back to the individual householder, but I would say if somebody says, I can't afford to, you, to stop using fossil fuels and use energy. The big challenge is at the systemic level, humanity cannot afford to keep on using fossil fuels. There are people in other parts of the world whose lives are very vulnerable and cannot afford to live a life where we can keep using fossil fuels because it means they literally lose the land on which they live or the rains don't fall next season. So for me, starting economic thinking with the donut, with recognizing the earth system stability. If every child in school learned not just about the human body and what health means in the human body, but the planetary body and the nine planetary boundaries and what they are and how they interact and what health means, I think it will be much easier for all of us to understand that we need to figure out this far more complex relationship between human progress and human well-being and planetary stability. So I, I don't have a quick and easy answer for everything you say. You're going to send me off thinking about it. Um, and if you have any ideas, because uh, I'm not a sophisticated political thinker or thinker on conflict. I'm just a humble, frustrated economic student who wants to rewrite this book and I, this bit. This is teamwork. If someone here thinks there's a book to be written, seven ways to think like a 21st century politician or a 21st century political scientist or a 21st century engineer, please write that book. We need these new ways of thinking. I'm just bringing a small piece of the puzzle. Great. Um, over there. Stand up. Let me start by uh, saying a big thanks for uh, spending time on developing the uh, economics, uh, the donut economics, and sharing it with us. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, you touched the subject of banks and, um, and money. Uh, so I noticed that there is a big movement um, in uh, a civilian movement on um, creation of money and split the creation of money uh, between banks and, uh, uh, and uh, government. How do you, can you say something about how or if and how that uh, fits in the uh, donut economics? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So um, the way I try and think about money is to remember that money is designed. And there's nothing inherent or natural or unchangeable about the financial and monetary system we currently have. And I learned a lot from the currency thinker Bernard Lyotard, Belgian, who works a lot in complementary currencies. And he taught me to think like this. Always when I see any kind of currency, whether it's the money, the euro, or that currency that the older people were paying to each other to care for each other. These are all currencies. Every currency has three design features that you want to ask yourself. Who has the right to create this currency? What character does it have? Does it bear interest? Does it bear demurrage, which is the opposite of interest? It loses value as you hold it. Or is it flat and value neutral? And what can it be used for? So it's creation, it's the character, and it's use. And those three characteristics of money determine our behavior, how we, we the, the design of currency changes what we do and don't do. It determines our relationships, who we're actually connected to, and it affects distribution. 
So let's come to the question I think you were talking about, that the idea that at the moment, most of the money in our economies is created. It's not, it's not the paper cash that we occasionally hand, carry around now. It's money created by commercial banks issued as debt that bears interest when they give a loan or give a mortgage. And that's actually the vast, the, the mass of what we call money in, in the economy. And after the financial crisis, this was questioned. And the idea that banks should both create money and choose who to allocate it to. Does it go for mortgages or speculation, which both raise the prices of existing assets and so create bubbles in housing and in, in, in commodity prices? Or does it get put into, say, small enterprises that actually want to expand? So the question was, should we separate these two functions of who gets to create money and who gets to allocate money? And that's why some people say they want to have 100% reserve-based banking, which means that the central bank essentially would be the one who creates the money supply and then allocates it to the banks who then choose who to lend it to. I don't have a, a, a strong particular view on this. I'm not enough of a currency expert, but what I always do with these things is realize that that design choice, and even just talking about it like this helps us realize it's a design choice and there's different ways of doing it. It has distributional consequences. When governments bailed out the banks, they were trying to actually stimulate banks to lend to small and medium enterprises to get economic activity going again, to create employment again. But the banks a lot of, held a lot of that money to rebuild their own books and didn't pass it on. So the distributional consequence is that the banks rebuilt themselves and then quite quickly started saying, oh, we could have a bonus again, you know, started paying out. Distributional consequence of who benefits from the bailout, it didn't pass through to the small and medium enterprises. So coming back to always asking that question of design, it shapes behavior, it shapes our relationships, and it shapes distribution. So I think it's really important to know that things can be redesigned. There's nothing immutable about the currency system we, ha we currently have. Thank you. Let's involve the back of the room. Uh, I'm sure there's somebody there. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Paola, I'm from Ecuador, and I'm happy to hear and to read in your book that you mentioned Bon Vivir, uh, because it's a concept from Andean culture. And uh, I'm proud of being, of being Ecuadorian, because we have in our constitution the concept. However, it's, uh, so far I don't see, I cannot, I cannot catch some changes in politics, first of all, and then in practice. So I was wondering what would you suggest us as economists to, to do in, in our country, because even though we have this beautiful concept, which is really, really amazing, uh, but we cannot actually put in practice because we are now, still we are depending on oil, uh, oil in, in the ground, so we are challenging ourselves in, in that sense. So what could you suggest us to, to do? <laughs> So I, want to think, I think one of the hardest things that happens to a country these days is to find oil in the ground. Because as Justin Trudeau said, who would, who would ever leave such a resource in the ground once you find it? And uh, it, it's almost like, you know, it, it, distorting vision away from perhaps another path that was going to be full. Oh, there's oil in the ground. This changes everything. We're going to have to do this instead. So I, I think that's a real challenge. So I'm starting with the mindset in economics. So create Rethinking Economics Nicaragua, right? Oh, sorry, what is it? Ecuador. Ecuador. Cre create Rethinking Economics Ecuador. Set up the first group. Join the international movement. Start talking to the economic students in the universities and get them to start saying, we want to be taught a broader mindset, because then at least you're starting to help the next generation of students who are going to come through and be the policymakers. Uh, tap into, there's so many fantastic community movements in, in Ecuador. Tap into those and help them start speaking this new language to build that constituency. I don't know how to fix politics. I really want someone to write this book, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Political Activist. Maybe you could write that book. I don't know how to fix all this stuff. I just believe that if we create a new language with new pictures, bring new words, so we name things differently, there is an alternative worldview available for those who want to be part of it. It's no longer, you know, Thatcher's line, there is no alternative, and welcome to economics, it's the market. There needs to be a coherent alternative way of thinking about this, so when the time is right, it can be taken up. But perhaps if you feel like writing that book about being a political activist, I want to read it. Great. Over there. Yeah. 
Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I have a short question about your view on the overpopulation of the human beings on the planet Earth. Because I think looking at your model um, by actually, if there would be less people on the planet Earth, we would already solve, maybe not solve, but at least it would help a lot of the issues that are there. Plus, all the very nice initiatives that are going on might well, be less effective if the population continues to grow as it currently is. So what's your view on this? I know it's a very ethical question, of course, but still. Did you ask about the old population or the whole population? No, the, the whole population. No, not older, elderly people. No, no, no. I thought it was a really <laughs> tricky question about euthanasia. No, okay. no, no, no. I know we're in the Netherlands. I know we're in the Netherlands, but still, no, I meant the whole population. Okay, phew. No, but, but seriously, though, one of the reasons why the world's population is growing is not just because people are having more children in another country, it's because we here are living longer. And so there's more people living a longer time. So, it, so the old population is relevant, it's ourselves, and we have longer life expectancy, and that's part of the reason why population grows. So, population. If I were to go back, is there a donut picture nearby? Uh, if I go back to the donut, no, nope. there it is. When I, when I introduce this diagram with groups of students, I'll often say, right, here's one way of putting humanity's challenge to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. Now, I want you to talk to the person next to you for three minutes. What do you think are the biggest determinants of whether or not we can do this? And I want you to come up with reasons and, and ideas that are so big and so simple that you can say them in just one word or maybe two. And of course, one of the first things that must come up is population, because how many people we are on this earth is hugely relevant for whether or not we can meet the needs of all people. Food, healthcare, education, transport, energy, it uses resources and each traditional person needs their fair human rights claim of resources. So of course it's relevant, but it's far from the only factor. There's extraordinary levels of inequality in the world at the moment. And, that, and you saw that climate change wedge overshooting with red. Around 10% of the world's carbon emissions are currently produced, sorry, around 45% of the world's carbon emissions are produced in the name of just 10% of the world's population. And we're probably among them, the global carbonistas. So inequality of resource use of wealth is hugely having an impact on whether or not we overshoot planetary boundaries, as well as governance, as well as technology, as whether what we think a good life is and how much is enough. But the good news on population is that we know how to slow down the growth rate Right, it's still growing. We're seven and a half. We're going to be probably nine. It could be 10. It could be 11, 12. So where we actually flatten out. And remember, this is nature's growth curve, right? The human population is not exploding. It's following nature's growth curve and we're starting to come to a plateau. But where we flatten out matters and we know how to reduce the growth rate. Invest in child health so babies don't die under the age of one. Mothers actually begin to believe their kids will survive. Invest in girls' education. Invest in women's rights and women's reproductive rights and women's voice. And these factors are strongly correlated with empowering women to have power of their own bodies. They begin to choose to have fewer children, add that up, and the population growth slows down. So if I go back to the donut, get everybody out of the social, over the social foundation. It's full of issues about health, education, gender, political voice. Meet the needs of all people, and this is one of the most effective ways of slowing the population growth rate. So it's actually a positive story. It's a win-win for humanity. If we meet the needs of all people, we, we, we level out at a lower global population. We are many, for sure. We are many. And we need to be smarter about how we share the Earth's resources and lower our growth rate together. Great. Anybody with a question on euthanasia? <laughs> no. Over there. Um, what about time? You talk a lot about the model, but uh, I have the impression that we're actually rather late by uh, changing this whole thing. So what is your impression? Do we have enough time to actually, well, uh, decrease the population, uh, the pollution, etc., etc.? If you look at Earth now and at uh, the world, it's a big mess. So, I guess you'll find that a rather pessimistic way to look at, to look at things. So, when I get students to play this game, come up with big factors that determine whether or not we can do it. You just named actually one of the really interesting ones. I remember the first time somebody said it. It depends on population, <coughs> depends on inequality, uh, technology, governance, aspiration, time. 
because we can't just take all the time in the world we want to do this. The Earth system is being incredibly patient and tolerant with us. Her resilience is being tested to its limits. And we don't know where those resilient points break down and we go over tipping points. So we don't have all the time in the world we want to sort this one out. Another one we could add there is luck because we don't know where those tipping points are and we don't know how things interconnect which is two reasons why we should be extremely precautionary and take far more urgent action than our governments currently take. So do we have time? I suppose in, in time for what? Do we have time to get to 1.5 degrees? That's extremely tough now. Two degrees? I don't know. But it, if we just said, oh, it's too late to get two degrees, let's all just go home and watch telly, then we go three, four, five, six degrees. So all of these different levels matter. And so I, 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 I'll end here, you know, people sometimes say, oh, it was lovely to hear you talk, you're such an optimist. And I say, I, did I ever say that? And actually, don't be an optimist if that makes you relax. You know, oh, it'll be fine, technology, humans are ingenious, we'll sort it out, we've always sorted it out before. No, don't be an optimist if it makes you relax. But then don't be a pessimist if that makes you give up. It's too late, I'm going home watch telly, because then it will be too late. Oh, that's whoa, not whoa, whoa, whoa. fair. No, that's not fair. Right but, uh, I, I think if you look at the world with all the technology, there are still people living in uh, poverty, which makes your heart cry out. I work a lot in South Sudan and um, the Central African Republic. And I can't comprehend that with all this knowledge we have, especially in the Western world, we still didn't figure out how to help these people, how to change the system, and how actually how to share. Because if you look at what's happening now in the United States, uh, against, and also actually in, in, in Europe against migrants, um, how are we going to solve that? If we don't want to share, uh, then what's the next step? I don't know. I'm just Thank one. you. Thank I'm... you all for coming. <laughs> but seriously, I'm not, I'm not, I can't sit here and pretend to know. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a global citizen as lost and frustrated as you. Like I say, I'm bringing one piece of the puzzle. And I'm coming from economics. And when you're trained in economics, you're taught almost nothing about politics and reality and, and the complexities. Oh, hold on. No, there's no mic. What, a final point. Yeah. Now, uh, it's because of the politician that it doesn't work, isn't it? I'm also an economist, and as soon as you have all these beautiful theories, and then a politician shows up and the whole thing uh, falls apart, and it will also be with your donut theory to be very negative, because it's not going to work. So how are you going to change that? <laughs> I, I think it's, a, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's a little broad, but let's <laughs> define. I mean, okay. when it comes to politicians, and I ask you this, this, this as well, you're basically saying if, if the, if the change comes from the grassroots and it goes up, politicians will eventually. Um, no, what I Help. say is the change comes in the mindset that we're taught. And politicians, I think, get away with it because we've come from an era of <clears throat> neoliberal economic policies that are built right. on the mindset that's taught. Economics, it's all about the market. Liberalize everything. The government, we're told, is incompetent. The government should just hang around in the margins and only step in where the market fails. Look what happens, you get the financial crisis. Your country has a much larger role of the state, than I think, than mine. But, you know, the UK, the US absolutely lapped up this neoclassical mindset that justifies and permits a very strong set of neoliberal policies. You care about inequality? Don't try to redistribute, that's a socialist thing to do. Growth will even things up again, except it doesn't. You care about the living planet? Don't intervene because you'll slow down technological development and technology will clean things up again, except it doesn't. So I passionately believe that the economic mindset that's been taught for decades has permitted these kinds of political stories to be told. So I want to create a new narrative that makes it far harder for politicians to get away with that because we recognize that growth doesn't clean up after itself, doesn't even things up again. And we start to talk about the economy in the living world and start to make climate change a part of every macroeconomic conversation so that no politician or Nobel Prize winner can ever again say, well, the health, the economy is coming back because growth is back again. That's what I'm trying to change. I have no claim to transforming the political 
character of the world, I really would love you to be part of the team because I, I never imagined that, you know, I'm, I'm just bringing one little piece of the puzzle. This is teamwork and we all need to be part of that change. Okay, thank you. Let's give um, a final person a question in this area here. Let's do two because we haven't been here yet. Now oh, they're gonna fight. This lady here first. Well. Um, hello, I have been working for the Dutch government for 20 years on sustainable development, the last five years on greening the financial sector. <coughs> I think you will have here a sector that will be uh, uh, an ally. If you look well, uh, the World Bank just published a new report changing the wealth of nations, not only the GDP, but also natural capital, social capital, countries that grow, but decline in natural capital. So there's new things within the financial sector moving. Uh, Catherine Collins, her work on the nature of investing might be interesting because it's the same way of thinking, but then from the financial work. So I think that here, aside from the politics, you might have an ally in your way of thinking and um, um, uh, on, on economics and, and having the financial sector as, as a system that, that supports your work. Okay. Good. I'll have a look. That's good to hear. Over there, yeah. First of all, thank you so much. My environmental economics classes started every day with the cross on the board and I hated it completely. Um, so thank you, this is great. Um, and then um, actually I maybe have a bit of a simple question which is for me very difficult because everyone has their conservative uncle I guess that in the discussion at some point just say oh yeah but it's just a question of supply and demand and then you're done. You can't discuss climate change, you can't discuss whether it's okay that he just bought a very expensive car that pollutes a lot. Um, so I would love your advice on what do you say to this conservative uncle on a birthday party or something like that? You get out the book. <laughs> and, um... Well, But I don't, yeah, if you start with supply and demand, some people really do see the world through the lens of supply and demand. In fact, I was talking with one UK economist who we were having a sort of a, a onstage debate about our different views. And I said to him, what is the biggest picture of the economy that you use in your work? And he said, well, it's supply and demand. And I look at the whole world through that lens. And then I know if something's a problem by how large the, the, you know, the gap is between the private costs and the social costs. And I just thought, wow, that, you know, it, it apparently worked for him, but he was literally seeing everything through this lens. So with your uncle, well, I'm, I'm, let me send him a copy of my book, because I'll tell you one of the nicest things that ever happened to me, a young woman, actually a bit like yourself, came up to me after a, a, a talk I'd given. She said, would you sign this book? She said, my father bought it. He, my father gave it to me. He bought it, he read it, and then he gave it to me and he said, I think I finally understand what it is you're doing. <laughs> so it was like family therapy. This father understood his daughter's work and her worldview through reading about a different way of imagining the economy. Uh, so yeah, give me a, your, I'll, I'll send a book to your uncle. That's great. I think there was a last question over here, if I'm not mistaken, the gentleman here. Yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You seem shocked. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, um, you said it a couple of times, you're just uh, an economist. Um, no, I'm just one person, I said. All right, um, but I'd like to ask you a question about um, evolution. Um, because the way we think of uh, evolution is based on um, competition and on selection and survival to fittest. Um, and I'd like to know if you think there's um, still room for this view in, uh, in, the, in the donut, or should we transform our way we think of evolution? So what I read of evolution is actually that this idea of the survival of the fittest was misread, and that it's the survival of the most fit, the species that best fits through its behavior or through its attributes, that best fits the environment, it's the best fit for. And what um, behavioral scientists say when they're uh, um, studying species is say that we, but we're, we're the most social of all animals, right? So we work in groups. And what happens is that individuals who are self-interested within a group tend to win within that group. And we all have people in our lives, in our families who do that, right? They take the last cookie and they get themselves in the best place, right? There are members of the group who always have that little bit of self-interest, but between groups, it's the most cooperative groups that succeed. So there's this ongoing tension. There's the self-interest within the group, but it's the most cooperative groups that succeed over the non-cooperative groups. So 
that's a very different story of evolution. And the survival of the, the, the most fit is the group, this lady saying, why can't we learn to share? I think, we've, I think economic theory has told us rational economic man is competitive. And I, that's as part of the, the way the damage has been done. We've been told that we win by competing. And actually, when we understand ourselves, we win by collaborating as a group. So it's part of that rewriting the story. Who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And when we start to understand that the survival of the fittest is the survival of the most fit, how does that change our understanding of how we need to work as communities, as families, as, as, as neighborhoods, as a society of nations? Do we have time to do that? I don't know, but I'm damn well going to go down fighting for it. Thank you so much. We have to leave it. Thank you. Thank you. We have to leave it here. Um, before, we, before we started, um, Kate Raworth told me she's in a phase of Dutch envy. She likes it here so much that I'm sure she'll be back soon. Uh, the book Donut Economics is for sale uh, just outside. Spend some money at the bar. That's a good way to keep the economy going. Um, <laughs> and thank you again so much thank for you. coming. Very Thanks. Nice. Thank, you. thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Great questions. That was fun.